Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Lutheran Church. So glad to welcome you into worship on this Reformation Sunday. While we make a couple of quick announcements, please grab that red fellowship pad at the end of your seating areas and fill them out. Our first announcement today is a brief explanation in case you're wondering, what does Reformation Sunday mean? Reformation Sunday is that day that we celebrate 500 years ago when Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses, 95 arguments, you might say, to the, walls of a, to the doors of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, Martin Luther thought that he was just pinning up a, a simple open letter at the time, but what he didn't know is that he would start a, a, a firestorm of controversy in the Christian church about the very nature of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Today, as we celebrate the reformation of the church that resulted from Luther nailing up those 95 theses and everything that went afterwards, we especially study the, the books of the Scripture. We celebrate the ways in our being challenge that we continue to engage with the Scriptures, the words of God that changed the church those 500 years ago today. One other announcement that I want to make really quickly is if you noticed on the south side of our lobby here, we have some construction underway, and it's actually blocking off the entrance to our normal women's restroom. Temporarily, we're restoring the old women's restroom that was here in the middle that used to be a men's rest, used to be a women's restroom, but then we made it a, a men's restroom. It's a women's restroom again. Now, there's one stall in that restroom, so if that one is occupied, or if the men's restroom is fully occupied and you need to go, you'll want to travel around the hallway and head down the hallway. There are more restrooms down that way toward the north side of the building. Follow the signs on your way to find those. But uh, please do excuse our dust during this time. We want to make sure that that, that section is, is useful to us as a church and that the visibility of that bathroom is... is actually useful to our visitors, especially by Christmas. So we're excited about that. We also want to remind you, in case you haven't noticed the announcement in the bulletin, that we are removing a couple of the front pews and replacing them with chairs. If you know of a church that might benefit from the use of our pews, they're in good shape, please do let us know or let that church know of this offer so that we can reach out to them or they can reach out to us for their use. And more details on that specific announcement are in your bulletin. The last thing that I want to briefly mention is since we're part in the midst of the being challenge and we're studying the scriptures, one particularly useful tool that we, you should know about is our being challenge webpage, clcs.org slash being. Watch the video right now. As we continue our congregational study, I want to make sure you're aware of a great resource that we've made available to you. It's at clcs.org slash being. This resource has all kinds of information available to you, both the day's info, which includes the current workbook page number that we're on, the day of the study that we're on, the social media post that you can find on Facebook or Instagram, along with the optional Bible reading available to you such that you don't even need to crack open a Bible to follow along with everything that we're doing. We also have more information about individuals, small groups, and kids' studies. We have workbook samples available there, along with our Being Challenged sermons. You can come back and listen to them anytime. As you scroll down to the resources section, we also have copies of the full schedule, the bookmark, the adult videos are easily accessible here, as along, with, along with the small group guide. There's a separate small group guide for teens if you'd like to do that as a family. And lots and lots of resources for kids, along with great videos that we think your kids would really enjoy. Be sure to check out this page each of the study. Follow along. It's a great resource for you. I don't know if any of you have done your challenge for today yet, but today's challenge is to start a Bible reading plan. And the pastors have put together an optional Bible reading plan. If you don't want to start, say, a one-year Bible, that's part of the schedule that we gave out with the books. We do still have books available if you're interested in starting the challenge a little bit late. But if you'd like to follow that Bible reading plan, that clcs.org slash being webpage is a big help to be able to jump quickly to our readings for each day. Now, that's it in the way of announcements, so I invite you now to join in our opening hymn. We will stand on the last verse, verse 4.
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, that in him we have redemption through his blood, the very forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
So we now invite the children of the congregation forward for our children's message. The congregation may be seated. All right, come on down and have a seat up here. Good morning, good morning, welcome. Today I have a question. Do you, do you read bedtime stories sometimes? Maybe. Do you have a favorite story? Any, what's your favorite story? Brown bear. brown bear. Yeah, big brown. Big brown bear, blue bull. Anybody? Is that the right one? Or is it brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have favorite stories? What's your favorite story, Trent? Splat the cat. Splat the cat. I don't know that one. Do you have a favorite? Pete the cat. What about you, Theo? The Berenstein Bears messy room. Yeah, your room's kind of messy right now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I had a favorite story when I was your age, too. And one of my favorites was Where the Wild Things Are. Where the Wild Things Are is, is a story all about a little boy named Max who gets into a little trouble and then he goes on an amazing journey. Now, Where the Wild Things Are is all about a little boy named Max, but as I've gotten older, I have another favorite book and I bet you can't guess what it is. Oh, um, I know what it is. What is it? Bible. It's a Bible. Yeah, that's right. One of my, one of my favorite books as an adult is, is the Bible. And it has a main character, too, a person that it's all about. Do you know who it is? Yes. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus, God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But Jesus isn't the only main character in the Bible, the person that you can learn about by reading the Bible. Do you know who else you can learn about by reading the Bible? You. Each of you. You can learn about who you are by reading the Bible. The Bible tells us that God loves us and treasures us, that we are God's children, a part of his family. As we read the Bible, we learn all kinds of things. And you might be able to, like I can, with the way the, where the wild things are, tell every part of the story just from memory. You don't even need to read the words to know what's coming next. You might be able to do that with your own favorite stories, but as you read the Bible, you get to learn more and more from memory who Jesus is and who you are. And the more you learn that just as part of your memory, the better you're able to live out who Jesus has called you to be. The better you're able to rest in the promises that he has for you. So let's go to Jesus now and pray and thank him for giving us the Bible. And we can bow our heads and fold our hands as we do. Dear God, thank you for giving us the Bible. Thank you for all the stories inside this book. Help us, Help us to, see Jesus to see Jesus in each of the stories, of the stories. And, help and help us to learn, to learn who we are too. <coughs> Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can return to your seats as we continue with our service. So our first reading for this Reformation Sunday comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3. So now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, 
since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, that this was to show God's righteousness, because in divine forbearance he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what has become of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the uh, the Christians in Rome, chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says that everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That as it is written, that how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing to the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We stand for the gospel. Our gospel reading comes to us from Luke chapter 24, where Jesus says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We remain standing for our hymn. Today, as we continue our being challenge, I want to take a a brief moment as we think on what it means to to rest our habits and found our habits in who we are as Christians, and as we think especially on, on the words of Scripture to tell a story which you may or may not have heard before. It's 1965 in Hungary, and a man named Laszlo Polgar is facing a monumental challenge. He's trying to find a woman who's willing to marry him. See, Laszlo was, in his own words, mind you, looking for a woman who was willing to jump on board because he had a theory. 
His theory was that geniuses are not born, they're made. They're educated, they're trained, and he wanted to test that theory on his own family. So ladies, how, how does this sound? Eager to test a theory with a strange man? Did I mention he wanted to turn his children into chess prodigies? Yeah, that's, that's the goal. He's going he's gonna to shape the children to be chess prodigies, train them from a young age to know chess and chess strategies and to practice chess all the time. Well, uh, whether any ladies here would be interested in such a man, fortunately for Laszlo, there seems to be someone for everyone. He meets a woman named Clara who's willing to jump on board with him. And in short order, they're married and they have three beautiful girls. And they get to work. Now, whatever you think of Laszlo and his theory, his experiment, uh, by most measures, you could say it was a, a, a success. His oldest daughter, Susan, was beating adults at chess within six months of starting to play at age four. The next daughter was even better. Sophia won a world championship chess competition at age 14. And Judith, the youngest, was even better. At 12, she wasn't just winning chess tournaments against people her age, wasn't just winning chess tournaments against other girls. She was one of the top 100 chess players in the whole world male or female. And at 15 years and four months, Judith Polgar became the then youngest international chess grandmaster ever, male or female. All three girls would eventually go on to achieve that title. And far from a tortured childhood that you might expect playing chess constantly all the time, the sisters say they enjoyed their upbringing. They, they loved the way they were raised, what they got to do. Now, let's remember how this all happened. Their, their crazy father decided he wanted to make them chess prodigies, decided upon an identity for them, and prioritized chess in his household above all else. Because he had chosen this identity, he gave them habits to match. And since we are talking about habits in this study, our habits as Christians grant you, maybe it's worth considering this a little further. Does our identity shape our habits? Or is it more appropriate to say that our habits shape our identity, make us who we are? I would guess that based on this story, we have to say that the answer is a little bit of both, don't we? See, the girls would never have been chess prodigies if their father hadn't given them habits of playing chess, studying chess all the time. And he would never would have done that if he hadn't decided ahead of time to give them the identity of chess prodigy to begin with. And for us, too, the same is probably true. We would... We would who we believe ourselves to be, who we think that we are, what we think our identity is, that shapes the kind of habits we choose for ourselves, doesn't it? And the habits that we choose for ourselves, they then shape who we become, who we are, who we believe ourselves to be, our dreams, our desires, our actions even. Now, I say all of this, of course, in the context of being challenged, but it, I can't help but think of my own kids over there as I say it, especially Theo, because you might assume, knowing that I'm a pastor, that we're raising him to be a pastor. <laughs> I mean, we do sing hymns every night before bed. We, we do say our prayers. We do read Bible stories throughout the week. He's in Sunday school. He's in Christian day school. He's in church every Sunday, just about. I'm sure he will get a fair share of people expecting him to be a pastor when he grows up. But if I'm honest, his habits are more in line with him wanting to be a musician, becoming a musician one day when he grows up. 
He's taking piano lessons. We've bought him I don't know how many musical instruments at this point, and he sat on my lap weekly at choir rehearsals for, year, for the first couple years of his life. And it shows. Not only at this point in his life does Theo have a rare ability called perfect pitch, I would argue he understands music theory than, better than most adults. I mean, months ago, he told his Sunday school teacher, oh, I prefer that song in F major. <laughs> and at a piano lesson just this past week, after playing the song that his piano teacher asked him to play, he decided that he didn't really like it in that key, so he played it again, transposing it into C major. And he wasn't really quite satisfied then, so he transposed it, again, chords and all, into G major on the fly, without prompting, simply because, well, he knows what he's doing, he knows how to do it, he loves music. It's crazy, and he's only four years old. Now, I say all of this not to brag. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but to ask again, do habits shape identity, or does identity shape habits? I mean, his identity is wrapped up in music, whether it shows for me or not. I was a music major at one time, but his mom is a music teacher in a public school around here. We listen to music all the time. We love music in our house. It's just who we are. But his habits shape that too. The piano lessons, all of those things we do, they shape his skill. They shape his ability. They shape who he's turning into. And if our habits shape our identity and our identity shapes our habits, if the answer is really both and yes, what habits are we choosing for ourselves? Not just for our kids. Because I do think that most dads today probably are more excited to go in the backyard and toss the pigskin than they are to read the small catechism with their kids. I have a feeling most of us enjoy many things more than we enjoy reading the Scriptures. I don't think this is a controversial thing to say, but if we really have a Christian identity, why isn't it shaping us more? You know, when we were exploring options, for this congregational study, the pastors were kind of hesitant to choose the being challenge. We worried a little bit that people would hear the theme of the study, developing a deeper relationship with God, praying more often, reading Scripture more often, and they would say, pastors, you say that to us all the time. We know, we've heard, all, we've heard it all before. And maybe that's been your response. Maybe you haven't picked up the book. Maybe you haven't joined a small group because you've heard it all before. Well, we worried about that, but to be honest, I found this study really fulfilling and even surprising at times, especially as I've been reading the devotions and the workbook throughout the week. I found, I found the devotions and the challenges very applicable and helpful as I think through my own habits, and I've, I've, they've challenged me to scrutinize my own personal relationship, not with, just with God, but with other people too. Now, having said all of that, I have to admit that this past week, I still skipped days of the study. <laughs> I still found myself on Friday saying, oh, I might have missed yesterday, and then I looked back and it was four days straight that I had missed of readings. <laughs> so you're not alone, if that's you. But as I scrutinized my habits, I decided to do what I didn't do last year and actually play catch-up. I, re I read back through all of the lessons that I had missed, and I was so glad that I did, because those community readings were so good. They were so, they were so meaningful and insightful and punchy. And if you have skipped them, please consider going back to read them again. 
But I say all of this just to acknowledge, yes, habits are hard. None of us reads the Bible and says, that was great, every last word was exactly what I wanted to hear in that moment and needed to hear in that moment. Often we read the Scriptures and our sinful flesh says, oh, that's, that's kind of heavy, Jesus. And maybe if, if you're just starting out, you read the Scriptures and Adam begat, and you, you glaze over. If that's you, you are not alone. Our sinful flesh, our sin, sin inside of us, the devil whispering to us will do anything to get us not to read God's Word because there's probably very little in this planet that he would, wouldn't rather us do, good or bad. But these habits are important. Hang on. Dive in as has often been said with good habits. The only, the best day to start a good habit is yesterday, right? Or 20 years ago. The second best day is today. If you've already missed the chance to be a being challenged child prodigy, that's okay, I have too. But there's no problem starting today, developing a good habit today. You know, if you struggle with this, it's not just me, it's not just you, it's people throughout the history of the church. The disciples often knew their scriptures, read their scriptures, they'd grown up in the church, and they still misunderstood countless things. That's why we hear in our gospel reading today that Jesus was opening their mind to understand these scriptures. And, and changing the way that they understood countless passages of the Bible. And they, they read their scriptures from then on with renewed interest and vigor and, and realization and, and with renewed hope. They, they found in there that, that not only was hope born and grace found, but a church was born. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, had been reading the scriptures for countless, countless years of his life, countless days of his life, studied as a monk, teaching them, and he still found in them new things, exciting things. He still only developed a love for this habit late in life. If you have that love for God's Word at this stage in your faith development, please know that you have a rare gift, one that has been given to you by the Holy Spirit, one that is not natural, and one that you should treasure. But if you don't yet, that's okay. We can get there. We can get there too with good habits. And the only way to find and embrace those good habits is through recognizing the identity that we have in Jesus Christ. For He is the one person in the history of mankind who, well, never needed to develop good habits. He just had them. When we see Jesus at a young age, we only see Him where? In the temple. And already there, Jesus is astounding the people gathered around him by his wisdom and his understanding. Talk about a child prodigy, right? Jesus is there because he knows who he is. He knows who he wants to be, who he's supposed to be, and he knows what he wants to do. He doesn't just want to know how to read the Bible. He doesn't just want to master the Scriptures. No, he wants to to save you. He wants to become your Redeemer, your Lord, your Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. Because of these identities that He had and embraced, He lived the perfect life. He read those scriptures. He prayed. He did all of those things we're going to talk about over the course of this study. He founded a church. He perfectly fulfilled the law of God dying on the cross, and rising again to new life for you. So what does that make you? What identity does that give you except the very beloved children 
treasured possessions of God, a holy people who he has called his own and given a mission, brought into his service to reach out to the world with that same love that he has shown to each of us. And so, rest in those promises, but even more, live your identity in Christ. And as you do, may the very peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You know, Christians throughout the centuries, oh, I apologize. We, we do have special music. Let's bow our heads briefly in prayer beforehand. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus' dedication to your word. Help us to share that same dedication and help us to find in him our very identities. Continue to open the minds of your disciples, even today, to the good news that we have from you in the scriptures. Help us to see in them both who we are and the great good news of who Jesus is for us, a firm foundation, one who is steadfast and immovable whether we are or not. These things we pray in his name. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand. We join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Amen. Said friends in Christ, I urge you to lift your hearts to God as we go to him in prayer. To God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name may be hallowed among us, and that all the world, through the very pure and true teaching of your word, may continue to know that very fervent love that is shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn us from all false doctrine and evil living, that your precious name may never be blasphemed or profaned among us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the very number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own will may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend those for whom we pray. Be with Ruth Messer, who is hospitalized. Be with Jill Jupin and Ray Ford, who prepare for surgery in the coming week. We pray for Jeff Townsend and Liz Dennison as they recover from surgery. We pray also for all those in our prayers today, that those needing strength and healing, those in our ongoing care, and those who need your peace. Lord, we pray that you would grant to them your care and your blessing in all things. We also lift up before you the family and friends of Danny Mikeworth and the family and friends of Helen Melcher. May you comfort them with the very words of Christ, that he truly is the very resurrection and life. We also lift up a prayer of thanksgiving as we join with Bob and Ruth Armeo as they celebrate with their friend Tamara Dolling, who celebrates that very fact that her cancer is now gone. We pray that you would be with her in the coming days, and may we all continue to return thanks to you, O Lord, for your work in our life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread, O Lord. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may, be, may rejoice in a good conscience before you, that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good, right, and salutary for us at all times and in all places to offer to you thanks and praise, O Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For you have kept your word and kept your people in your word, so that the very gates of hell shall not prevail, nor your gospel ever be silenced by error or deceit. Knowing you as both just and the justifier, we join our voices with all the faithful who have gone before us in your church, and that we join together with the angels and archangels in praising you and singing the glory of your name throughout all eternity.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Said this, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
now receive this gift of our Lord's body and blood, depart in his peace and with his forgiveness. Amen. Let us pray. That, O God, our refuge and our strength, you raised up your servant Martin Luther to reform and renew your church in the light of your living word, to defend and purify the church in our own day, and grant that we may boldly proclaim Christ's faithfulness unto death and his vindicating resurrection, which you have made known to those in every age, that given in the scriptures and made clear to us through Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The so one thing prior to our benediction is that there was one additional announcement that we wanted to share with the congregation. It is a wonderful gift as we celebrate this very Reformation, as we celebrate the fact that we are part of a church that is in all things committed to that very fact of putting God's word into the very language of the people, not only in the scriptures, but also putting that very word of God into the language of the people in that very worship life as well. So that Luther was so committed to making sure that people had that opportunity to engage and connect with, his, with their Lord Jesus. And so as we set our sights for the future of Calvary, as we look at some of those different things that we are looking at, there was one thing that we wanted to share with you as we are looking to the start of January 2023, is that starting in January 2023, we are going to be making a transition within our 1045 worship service is that we are going to be transitioning to a weekly contemporary offering at our 1045 service, that this might be best summarized because of clarity and consistency so that we can provide that opportunity for people to be connecting in God's word each and every week in their preferred worship style. So that right now with that back and forth style, it's not very clear and consistent within that, as well as also when you begin to look at it, so that on an average month, we have 12 worship services spread out over the three different ones over four weekends, is that two of those very 12 are contemporary services, and all of our extra services, they're all also traditional. And so we are looking at that time to begin making that transition, is that starting in January 2023 for our 1045 service. What we wanted to just let you know is that if you have questions or want to talk with the pastors, spiritual care members, or others, but please look for more details and more opportunities that we'll be sharing more about this in the coming days. But at this time, let us turn, return to our worship as we now celebrate that very legacy of the Reformation. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Since we just finished our week of committing to community, I'd be remiss if I didn't encourage you to greet those around you and to introduce yourself if you don't know them or if maybe you just have forgotten their name. Maybe they have too. So, commit to community, but also have a great and blessed Reformation week. And we extend a great thank, uh, thank you to our White River City Brass who are here with us today. Thank you so much.